I'm Amelia Mosley and I'm here at the Museum of Australian Democracy at Old Parliament House. And today we're bringing you a special BTN episode that's all about democracy. We'll find out more about Australia's democratic journey and look at whether kids should have more of a say on who runs the country. But first, let's go back to where it all began. And no, I'm not talking about that building behind me. The beginnings of democracy are way, way older than that. Check it out. Hey guys, 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 I've got a totally radical idea. You're gonna love it. How about, you know, instead of those rulers making decisions, we, the people, vote and decide on issues that affect us. <laughs> I know, right? It's a great idea. <laughs> Okay, so while it might not have gone exactly like that, most people agree it was the ancient Greeks who came up with the idea of democracy. In fact, democracy is the combination of two Greek words, demos, which means people, and kratos, meaning power or rule. Democracy meant everyone would be given a say on big issues. Well, almost everyone. Oh, well, except women don't get to vote, or slaves, or sort anyone who doesn't own land, you know, poor people, but, uh, but everyone else gets to vote. Yeah. yeah, while it wasn't exactly perfect or fair, it was a pretty revolutionary idea for the time. When most nations were ruled by kings and pharaohs and dukes and alike that were born into their jobs and didn't really give their subjects much of a say. In Greece's democracy, people could meet in front of rulers to vote on new laws and voice their opinions. After the Greeks, the Romans had a go at their own type of democracy, which lasted for a few hundred years. But as time went on, new rulers took over, things changed and democracy kind of died out for a while. Fast forward to the Middle Ages and monarchies were all the rage again. You know, that's where kings and queens rule. And the people, well... Oh, well, we don't get no say. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. What was that? Oh, uh, nothing. I was just, uh, admiring the monarchy, sir. So lovely. So fair. But in England in 1215, a document called Magna Carta came along. What? Magna Carta. It's a very important document that basically evened the playing field, a little bit. It meant that even English kings and queens had to follow the law. They couldn't just do whatever they wanted. And it gave a bit of power back to the people. Oh, well, I'm practically a king now, aren't I? Uh, not that much power. Oh. Slowly, over the next few hundred years, the idea of democracy started to take hold again. In the 18th century, America had itself a revolution, drew up a constitution and declared themselves a democracy. And in the centuries that followed, democracies of different types popped up all over the world. Here in Australia, we have a constitutional democracy, which means we have a very important document, the constitution, which outlines how the country runs. We're also a representative democracy, which basically means that we don't meet to vote on laws. Instead, we elect a representative to do that for us. Yep, I'm talking about... Did somebody say politician? <laughs> uh, I was about to. Vote for me and you won't have to say anything at all. I'll say it for you. Yep, politicians like, uh, well, not like this guy, but uh, like these guys. They have the job of representing us in Parliament by listening to their voters and making sure their voices are heard. Today, democracy is the most common form of government around the world. And while it's not totally perfect, a lot of people reckon it's something to celebrate. Uh, stop talking. That's my job. You just vote, OK? Which type of government has a royal family? A monarchy, an oligarchy, or a communist government? It's a monarchy. What ancient Greek city is considered the home of democracy? Is it Sparta, Rome, or Athens? It's Athens. How were members of the Athenian Council chosen? Were they directly elected by the people, selected in a lottery, or chosen by other councillors? 
They were selected in a lottery. Members of the council would suggest laws, then citizens would get together in one area known as an assembly and vote on them. Not everyone got to vote though. Who was excluded from the assembly? Was it women, slaves, children, or all of the above? It was all of the above. Which country is the world's biggest democracy? Is it the USA, Indonesia, or India? It's India. While Australia is a democracy now, it hasn't always been that way. In fact, it's been less than a century since all Aussies were guaranteed the right to vote. Let's have a look back at our long and sometimes difficult road to universal suffrage. Uh, I can't believe I have to spend my Saturday waiting in line to vote. All right, let's get this over and done with. Huh, what's up with that booth? Hey, you! Have I got two voices in my head? No, down here. Is this real? Yes, and I see people like you all the time. Just don't appreciate voting. Well, I'm going to show you why you're wrong. Oh, and um, how are you going to do that? <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, I'm here to vote. Vote? <laughs> Vote! <laughs> yep, back in the late 1700s, Australia was a British penal colony and the convicts had uh, very few legal rights. Too right. <laughs> and certainly weren't able to vote. No. Hey, what did you do there? <laughs> so here we are, a few decades later. Hey! You got out. Do you get to vote now? What? No, Amal. Even though there were a lot more free settlers by this stage, most of them still couldn't vote. In 1840, South Australia became the first colony to give men the right to vote. But you had to be a wealthy landowner. A lot of people thought that wasn't fair. In fact, it caused quite a bit of drama here in Victoria's Goldfield in 1854. The diggers got sick of paying authorities for the right to mine when they weren't given any say on government. Too right. So they decided to rebel. Yeah, we should rebel. The Eureka Rebellion was a big deal. And it helped put pressure on the colonies to allow all men who were British citizens and over the age of 21 to vote. <coughs> We can vote now? Well, you see, he can. Yeah. You cannot. No. 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 Why not? I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. <laughs> Just enforce them. That's right, Amal. While male British citizens over the age of 21 could all vote by the end of the century, women weren't allowed. A lot of women fought really hard for the right to vote. They were known as the suffragettes. Suffrage means the right to vote. And it paid off. In 1894, South Australia's government became the second in the world to give women the right to vote. And one year after Federation, women were allowed to vote for the new Australian government. Wow, we're really getting somewhere. Go Australia. Well, hmm, we're still not there yet. Not all men and women could vote. The same law that gave the right to women actually stopped Indigenous Australians from voting, along with many other non-white people, unless they were already registered at state level. In fact, it wasn't until 1962 that the government finally made a law guaranteeing all Indigenous Australians the right to vote in federal elections. Whoa, what a journey. It sure was. Of course, now it's compulsory for you and every other Australian over the age of 18 to vote. And, you know, it's something you should be grateful for. You know what? Too right, Magic Voting Booth. Oh, um, that voting booth, it's a bit... You'll see. It's fine.
Which country was the first to give all of its free citizens the right to vote? Was it Australia, the US or New Zealand? It was New Zealand. What's the name of the special type of national vote that's needed to change the constitution? Is it a referendum, a referral or a refurbishment? It's a referendum. Since 1901, Australia's had 19 referendums proposing 44 changes to the constitution. Only eight changes have been agreed to. What was it that Australians voted on in our most recent referendum? Was it whether same-sex couples should be allowed to marry, whether Australia should become a republic, or whether Indigenous Australians should have constitutional recognition? It was whether Australia should become a republic and the vote happened in 1999. I declare the question resolved in the affirmative. <laughs> There was a big national vote on same-sex marriage much more recently in 2017. What was that sort of vote called? What a day for love, for equality, for respect. It was a plebiscite. It wasn't a referendum because it wasn't to change the constitution. Exploring Australia's democratic journey is one of the aims of the Australian Museum of Democracy. And I'm here with Steph, who's going to take me around and give me a tour. Wonderful. Let's go on an adventure and see what we can find. Let's do it. Wow, Steph, it is a beautiful building. It is an absolutely gorgeous building. Yeah. And it was built in 1927. Right. And Parliament sat here for 61 years until 1988 when they moved up to Australian Parliament House. So this building is a wealth of stories and historical moments. First female senator, first me female member of the House of Representatives. This is the first occasion upon which a woman has addressed this house. We had our first Indigenous Senator, Neville Bonner. It feels wonderful, I can assure you. So it's a wonderful place that has really set up the foundations for what we see in our democracy now. So here we are, Amelia, in the House of Representatives. It's such a beautiful chamber. I can see all of this interesting mm. stuff on the table here. So what's going on here? So we have a fantastic interpretation team that work with us here at the museum so we can bring our spaces to life. And so what you can see there is a moment captured in time. We're looking at the beginning of the day. It's the era of Bob Hawke, who would have been the prime minister at the time. He would have sat over that side of the chamber next to the dispatch box. And over here would have been John Howard uh -huh. in opposition. So he's our second longest serving prime minister. Medicare has added between three and four billion dollars to the federal budget. Enormous here Amelia is the speaker's chair and you'll notice the intricate detail. It's a replica of the speaker's chair that's in the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. And it was a gift to us in 1927 because they were so excited that we were opening our Parliament House here in Canberra that they wanted to give us such a special gift. What's really interesting though, is that during World War II, there were the bombing raids on Britain and the chair was lost. It was burnt to the ground. And the original? Yes. And so, we were able to help them and we were able to recreate the speaker's chair based on the copy that they've given us. So the one now in their parliament house? It's a copy of a copy? It's a copy of a copy. You're kidding. Yep. Wow, what a fun little historical tale. Yes. It's incredible. Yeah. And so why didn't this chair, uh, I suppose it's pretty difficult to move, Steph. But it wh is. Why didn't this come to the other Parliament House, this incredible gift? Yeah. So something that you'll notice about the chair is the fact that the coat of arms is right represented at the, at the front here, the British coat of arms. Mm. Um, so you've got the lion and the unicorn there. And so there were lots of conversations around whether this fitted with the new design of Parliament House and whether we needed a change in the speaker's chair, something that more represented Australian values and Australian traditions, 
you know, rather than so much of our British heritage. I've noticed there's a bit of a platform up there. What's that for? So up here behind us, this is actually the press gallery. And so ah. this is where the journalists would sit. So tell me something, would mm. that have included the ABC? Absolutely, it would have included the ABC. We even have a broadcasting booth at the back of the chamber. We're broadcasting from a soundproof booth that's been built into the chamber of the House of Representatives. One of the fantastic things about our democracy is that the press have always been involved so that they can firsthand hear what our politicians are discussing and what issues are being debated in the chambers. It's so important that we have the press here so that we can allow access for the public to what's going on. Will the Prime Minister make a statement before the rising of the Parliament which would indicate the possible effect of the present conditions in the United States of America? So, Amelia, here we are in the Senate. Oh, wow. So much debate would have happened in these spaces. We have over 90,000 students that come and visit us here at the Museum of Australian Democracy every year. And one of the significant moments for them is being able to sit in these seats, oh. being able to sit in the chamber and experience the history from them, for themselves. Pretty cool. It does make you feel powerful, doesn't it? It does. It does. Powerful, Com important. Powerful mm. and comfortable. So this is one of our exhibitions here at the Museum of Australian Democracy. Mm. And this one is all about democracy are you in? Yeah. And it really links into the real world. You can see there's a lot of badges which explore significant protests from our history. Um, so you've got uranium mining, you've got indigenous rights, you've got links to the Franklin River. So there's sustainability in there, there's you know, our environmental issues. You've got the yes vote for marriage equality there as well. So this is our democracy workshop space. And after students have visited the chamber, uh, either the Senate or the House of Representatives, we use this fantastic image to be able to, to explain to students and explore democracy and explore people power and how they fit into the conversation. So this is really an opening for us to be able to say, your voice is important. It's not just about voting, protesting petitions. It's about considering how you can make a difference in your classroom, in your school, in your local community. They don't have to wait to be able to vote. Their voice is very important in all of the conversations in our democracy in their daily lives. In what year was Old Parliament House opened? 1907, 1927 or 1987? It was opened in 1927. When was the first woman elected to Australia's federal parliament? 1901, 1943 or 1960? It was in 1943. Two women entered the parliament that year. Enid Lyons became the first member of the House of Representatives and Dorothy Tagney became Australia's first female senator. True or false, Australia's first female parliamentarians didn't have their own toilet in Parliament House. It's true, Dorothy Tagney and Enid Lyons had to use a toilet set aside for junior staff. Australia's female parliamentarians didn't get their own toilet until 1973. And do you know who this is? It's Neville Bonner, Australia's first Indigenous parliamentarian. There has been a debate that's been going on in Australia for many years now, and that's whether the voting age should be lowered. So let's take a look at that issue. Turning 16 comes with a lot of big responsibilities. You can learn to drive. You can also get a full-time job if you want. And open your own bank account. So should you also get a say in who runs the country? 
I think that uh, anyone from the age of 16 or up should have the right to vote if they wish to do so. If you're 16 and that's the legal age to drive, then like it should be the legal age to vote as well. Right now, in Australia, the minimum voting age is 18. But it hasn't always been that way. For a long time in Australia, the minimum voting age was 21. But after two world wars and a war in Vietnam where some 20-year-olds were forced to go and fight, many thought it wasn't right that young Aussies could die for their country but not vote. So the voting age was lowered in 1973. The Liberal government is recognising that 18-year-olds have minds and that they are aware and that they are conscious of what's going on. The same thing happened in many other countries and now 18 is a pretty common age for allowing citizens to vote. There are a few reasons for that. Many reckon by 18, most of us are pretty mature and should be able to make informed decisions about who should run the country. It's also an age at which many people leave school and maybe get a full-time job. You might also drive and live by yourself, so you're likely to be affected by decisions that governments make. But some reckon younger Aussies also deserve to have a say. We are sick of our planet being sold off for profit. So we've kind of seen like with stuff from strikes and protests of the young people that have been done for like the last two years even or even the whole COVID period, we can see that a lot of young people are very strongly passionate about the earth, the environment and also about allocating money properly to people that are in need and supporting everyone in the society. This is Shania. She's the Youth Governor of South Australia and she's pretty passionate about reducing the voting age to 16. If you're allowed to participate in society at the age of 16 as a mature growing up or a young person growing up, then you should be old enough to also have a say and have an opinion about the world in which you're growing up in. Shania's not the only one. Many other people have pushed to change the voting age to 16. Like Jordan Steele John, he's Australia's youngest ever senator and a big advocate for giving young people a bigger say in who runs the country. I found over this time that 16 and 17 year olds are passionate and want to have their say in our politics. They are overwhelmingly in favour of lowering the voting age. A few years ago he introduced a bill to lower the voting age and while it didn't become law, the issue hasn't gone away. And not just in Australia, in fact several countries have now lowered their voting ages to 16, including Brazil, Scotland, Austria and Argentina. But not everyone's convinced. In fact, surveys have shown that the majority of Aussies would rather leave the voting age as it is. Some say 16-year-olds just aren't interested enough in politics and would rather wait a couple more years. Others have suggested that if the voting age were to be lowered, then it shouldn't be compulsory for 16 to 18-year-olds. So you'd only vote if you wanted to. But what do you think? I think that a lot of people under the age of 18 do want to vote because it will definitely impact them going into uni and being able to drive. A lot of 16 year olds that I know would love to be invested in politics and have their voice heard but also it should be voluntary because a lot of 16 year olds don't have that maturity or know that much about politics and I also believe that the parents should be involved a bit more in showing um, those younger people how to vote. Yes, thank you so much. Well, that's it for this BTN Democracy Special. I hope you liked it and you learned something. You can check out more specials just like this one on our website, as well as teaching resources and lots of other stories on all sorts of topics. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you soon.